Welcome back. Our conversations continue here at Davos 2024. And joining me now is Ian Bremer of the Eurasia Group. Uh, Ian, always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here. Sure. You know, my first question to you, the big read from Davos 2024. What's the takeaway? Uh, that uh, most of the people talking about AI don't know what they're talking about uh, because everyone is talking about it, yes. right? And there are real experts here, and, and I'm glad for it. But if you walk down the promenade, uh, literally uh, half of the storefronts have something AI related. And uh, most of those companies are not actually reflecting that. So I, I think it's important to, look, I'm a believer I and know, it is an rolling out. I'm an AI optimist, but, uh, but there is a lot of, I mean, look, people, a lot of co people come to the World Economic Forum to network and to sell. Yeah. And, and if you get too many elevator pitches this year, uh, they're all about people that don't understand AI. You know, but since we started talking about AI, let's address that issue and this big talk about regulation. Yeah. But given the power asymmetry, the power that the tech uh, platforms wield, as well as what governments are willing to let go of or what governments are willing to do, I mean, what are we talking about? Here? Well, what governments are capable of doing, I mean, they are prioritizing it, they are moving quickly, but the technology is moving a lot faster than the government. So, I mean, I think the point, I, I've been in a number of panels, I've, I've led one uh, on governance on AI. Mm. And, and the people on those panels represent governments, yes. right? It's the United States, it's the EU, uh, it's a little like Singapore, Japan, the UAE, that kind of thing. But the fact is, these companies mm. are increasingly sovereign in determining what AI is doing, what shows up on their platforms, how they engage, how you engage with it. And so I think we need to understand that if you want to look at governance of AI, yeah. you need to first and foremost understand the companies. First. First, understand the companies, and you need to know their business models. Mm. I mean, for example, we would, we would care whether governance on AI was driven by a democratic country like the U.S. or India or, or driven by an authoritarian country like China or Russia. We would care about yeah. that. That would matter. And yet when we look at companies, we think that if Meta drives or Microsoft or X, it doesn't matter. That's not true. Mm. Like if Apple is the company that ends up driving AI for the world, that's going to have radically different implications for society, mm. for security, and for our political systems than if open AI does or if Anthropic does. And that's a conversation that is absolutely not being had right now, and the companies don't want to have it. No, I agree with you. That is not a conversation that's happening. But the conversation that is happening, and I know you refer to it in your global risk report, is that, that we're living in an era of geopolitical recession yes. and and so let's talk about those big risks and you believe that the u.s and the u.s con confronting itself is one of the top global risks that the world faces this year i do and and, and actually since we have a little time i'll take a step back yes uh, this is my first g0 davos okay i've been talking about the g0 for since a long 2012. time since 2012 <laughs> you're right but but this truly this year is when everyone recognizes it because we have three major wars going on in the middle east mm. in europe and inside the united states and there's no leadership no one believes that they have any ability to stop it um people in this event this year feel powerless to try to respond there's no road map to improve any of those three wars. And so people are trying to respond to it. That, to me, is what a G0 world is all about. And it, it's particularly geopolitically dangerous in 2024. You know, you talked about uh, people feeling helpless. Uh, at the start of Davos, we had the National Security Advisors meeting to try and see what can be done as far as Russia Ukraine is concerned. Zelensky was here. Uh, you believe that he is fast losing support. I do. Uh, this was, uh, I mean, if you were looking at who's up, who's down in Davos this year, Sam Altman up, <laughs> uh, Volodymyr Zelensky down. Um, and he got a standing ovation and people care about him. Uh, but it is very clear that he is not able to take more territory back, even though he has every legitimate reason to be able to. He's having a harder time getting military support. The White House just said, just had to stop yep. additional support. There's no more money. And, and, and just an hour ago, I read that the Speaker of the House in the United States pushed back hard on the White House, mm -hmm. saying he's not accepting a $60 billion deal. Now, two of the American senators that came here, one decided at the last minute to cancel, and one left early. Um, of two of three yeah. uh, because they're trying to work so hard in Washington to get that $60 billion done. They're not in Davos because of Zelensky. So there is an effort 
But even in the best case scenario, he's going to be playing defense this year. And, and playing defense at a time that Trump might be winning the U.S. presidential election will certainly be the next nominee. And Trump says, I'm going to end this war in a day. How's he going to do that? He's going to tell Zelensky, you've got to accept the present territory loss. That's unacceptable for the Ukrainians. It'll divide Europe. The Europeans are tired. They don't want to spend the money. If, if Trump says, I'm going to cut a deal, a lot of Europeans will work with Trump to cut a deal. That's a very serious problem for everybody here. You know, speaking of serious problems, let's talk about the instability in the Middle East. And the big yeah. concern is, are we going to see this escalate? And is this going to be restricted to, to Gaza or beyond? And we're already starting to see that happen. I, I, as we wrote in our risks report um, a week and a half ago, we think it's virtually certain that this war will escalate significantly, uh, not only because the war in Gaza will continue, uh, but also because you will see greater levels of skirmishing with the Hezbollah in the northern front and because the Houthis are not going to be deterred by the United States, even though there's been direct military strikes on Yemen. Just in the last few days, uh, we've seen terrorist attacks in Israel. Uh, we've also seen um, mi military strikes between Iran and Pakistan, Pakistan both ways. I mean, there is a lot of tinder um, and it is very dry. And it is very easy for a spark to ignite this. Uh, I think another point is that you have millions and millions of Muslims around the world that are becoming more radicalized on this issue as the violence continues. Some of them will turn to violence. Some of them will turn to terrorism, not just in the Middle East, but in countries like Pakistan and Malaysia, where there's an informal Hamas embassy, and Indonesia, where 1.5 million Muslims demonstrated against Israel and Europe and the United States. So there's just way too many. Russia, Ukraine is not going well, but the Russians have been very careful not to engage in strikes outside of Ukraine. They don't want NATO to get directly involved. In the Middle East, there is no such caution. There's no ability to prevent these agents from escalating. Mm. So what happens then as far as the Red Sea is concerned? I was just looking at the Merce CEO earlier today saying that uh, this could go on for much longer than people expect. Oh, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if we came back to Davos next year and you still find the Red Sea impassable. Uh, I mean, the Houthis are benefiting uh, from having uh, their fight against the Americans. They're benefiting from being seen as the leaders of the axis of resistance against Israel and the United States. Uh, it makes them more money, but it also makes them more popular on the ground in Yemen against their opposition. Remember, there's been a civil war in Yemen, and so they're fighting for more leverage internally. And the United States striking the Houthis so far has helped them. It hasn't hurt them. I, I, I think that the, this war in the Red Sea is increasingly taking on a life of its own that is very much separate from what's happening in Gaza. And do you get a sense that people are starting to factor in the implications of this as far as the war on inflation is concerned, which is not done yet? Uh, I mean, freight rates are already doubled on some routes at this point in time. You know, the long-term implications of how this could play out as far as the economy is concerned. I, I think this probably should reduce some of the optimism in the markets that rates, Fed rates are going to go down so much in 2024. I and mean, I do think that the U.S. recovery is going to continue. I think that there are lots of elements of the U.S. economy that's very strong. But the uncertainty, both geopolitically from an expanding conflict in the Middle East, as well as uh, a uh, El Nino year mm. where we're going to have, again, I mean, it'll be the hottest year on record. There's just going to be climate events that are going to be very expensive. They're very disruptive. And when you have to respond to that, that also diminishes some of your fiscal reserves. So, yeah, I, I think that's probably going to be pushing inflation a little higher than you'd like it to be. Well, let's talk about elections, because this is going to be the year as far as elections are concerned. I know you're doing a panel on this tomorrow. So, yeah, I mean, you know, what, what's, what are you going to be watching for besides, of course, the U.S. and uh, what happens there? You know, honestly, that I, I'm going to be telling people that's the one you need to worry about. I mean, of course, Pakistan. Uh, because uh, Imran Khan is, uh, you know, sort of uh, is, is very, very popular and is being kept on the sidelines, and that can lead to a lot of violence, a lot of social instability. Uh, but people in the U.S. and Europe aren't focusing very much on Pakistan. The big countries they're focusing on, Mexico, India, Indonesia, the European Union parliamentary elections, none of these are elections that are showing instability. They're actually continuity elections. In Mexico, AMLO gets his person in. In India, Modi gets another five-year term. Uh, in Indonesia, Joko gets his person in. And in the European Union, even though you have rising levels of populism in individual countries, the European parliamentary election will probably reflect the same coalition uh, that is center-right, leading uh, the EU, the world's largest 
uh, trading block as is the case today. So lots of people are going to the ballot box. Most of them don't matter very much. They're fairly stable outcomes. Also, of course, Russia, I can't forget Russia <laughs> because in Russia, people are going to be voting for Putin or Putin. And I mean, I don't know. It's going to be a cliffhanger, but it might be Putin. And if it's Putin, well, we'll still have Putin. So, I mean, we can talk about that too. <laughs> yes, but you know, uh, 2023, when you left Davos, did you expect that the economy would turn out to be as resilient as it eventually has? Um, uh, or do you walk away from Davos 2024 feeling better about the year or bleaker? Uh, I, economically, I walk away feeling a little better. Um, I think that with the exception of China, um, most of the rebound, especially in, developing, in the developed world, has been a little stronger. I mean, U.S. unemployment rates are still relatively low. Wages are higher. Um, you know, the EU inflation has come down a little faster than people expected. Oil prices didn't go through 100 bucks yep. um, at the second half of 2023. Those outcomes are a little better than I would have seen. I mean, I'm not an economist. I'm a political scientist. But if you'd asked me as a watcher of global mm. events, yeah, I feel pretty good about that. But the geopolitics are every bit as bad as I expected. And we've got a Middle East war. Right. I mean, that was not on my bingo card. I mean, the Middle East before October 7th yeah. was looking more stable. Jake Sullivan said this. He said it eight days before October 7th. He said, look at the Middle East. I, don't, I barely need to spend time on it. He said, you know, you've got the Abraham Accords yeah. that the Americans did, Trump administration. You've got Iran, Saudi Arabia that the Chinese did. You've got the Gulf states working together. Qatar no longer out in the cold. Yeah. They did that themselves. You know, even like you look at Assad and and Syria is now working with the GCC again. The Americans may not like that, but it's stabilization. Yemen looked like a ceasefire was holding. And then, of course, you get Saudis starting to normalize with Israel. So everything was going well. And then Jake jinxed it because he said, ah, no problem. And eight days later, the Palestinians said, well, yeah, but no one has cared about us. And we are angry in the context of an Israeli government that was angering its own population and taking more land illegally from the Palestinians in the West Bank, and that led to an explosion. We didn't talk about China. No. What's the read on China? They've got 140 people at Davos. Um, they had a state visit with the Swiss just beforehand, a trade agreement. I'm talking to CEOs all over the place here who are saying the Chinese are giving them more time, giving them more access, and they want them in. Because when you have CEOs that are saying your country is uninvestable and your economy is not doing so well, you need to reach out. Xi Jinping has delivered that message, mm. and that is reducing risk. Will the charm offensive work? It's working on some companies. It's working on companies that want to be in China. You know, uh, two, three, four percent growth is not horrible if you think it's stable and you have a good relationship with the government. You know, you can make it for a while. I, I see a lot of CEOs when, when the China, when you've been trying to get a license for China for a long time, you've been trying to get a deal, then suddenly they say yes. You know, most CEOs who aren't there for very long anyway, they say, OK, I'm going to go. I'm going to pay attention. So I think it's working. But of course, it's working late because we've already seen a lot of investment away from China towards India, towards Mexico, towards Indonesia, towards Vietnam, and the Chinese are responding to that. So, I mean, their structural challenges are both international and domestic, and they're real. Well, let's talk about India, and that's why I'm going to close. Uh, you know, it's taken over the promenade. Uh, it, it is clearly front and center as far as conversations are concerned. Investors bullish on India, relatively much more stable in comparison to most large economies today. What's the read on India? Well, I mean, India has taken over the promenade because it's not just one country. It's a bunch of states. I mean, they all come in and they plant their flag individually. I keep telling, you know, sort of my friends back in the U.S., how come Texas can't have a, <laughs> uh, you know, a booth here, right? I mean, the leaders of both fossil fuels and renewable energy in the United States. I mean, you, know, you can't just do Karnataka. It just doesn't feel fair. Um, but, but yeah, of course, I mean, India is a very good news story because you have a very, very stable election with a leader that has over 75 percent approval. There's, I mean, the last three elections, the state elections, they did better than he expected, than the BJP expected. He's an economic reformer. He's pretty pro-business. So you're getting the growth. You're also, it's the one major country in the global south that can attract financing for transition energy, so that really matters. Uh, and in addition to the global south relations, they also are trying to build stronger bridges with the West, the U.S., Japan, um, and Europe. Canada, not so much. Uh, but that's a pretty good news story. So India feels, you know, at Davos this year, no one's complaining about it. Well, Ian Bremer, always a pleasure. Many pleasure. thanks for joining us Thank here you. in Davos. Thanks very much for your time and look forward to more conversation in 2024. Good to see you. We are going to take a break here, but there's plenty more that's coming up. Don't go anywhere. We're back in a minute with more.